Thanks, Todd. And this mic on. Here we go. I think it's on now. All right. Um, when we're talking about uncertainty, the waters of the United States are a prime example. Um, it really involves the interaction of Congress, administrative agencies, and the courts, and none of them seem to be able to untie this complicated knot. So let me set the stage for our discussion by explaining the problem. This is all about the Clean Water Act and what federal jurisdiction is under the Clean Water Act. So Congress enacted the Clean Water Act to restore and maintain the chemical, physical, and biological integrity of the nation's waters. And it does so in numerous ways, but for purposes of our discussion, two are particularly important. They involve permitting programs. And the permitting programs are for discharges to navigable waters. So we have a NPDES permitting program, basically involves wastewater that involves the discharge of wastewater. And we have a Section 404 program under the Army Corps of Engineers, which involves dredged or fill material being placed into navigable waters. Well, Congress thought it was doing us a favor in the Clean Water Act by defining navigable waters. Navigable waters mean the waters of the United States, including the territorial seas. So that's perfectly clear to everybody. Actually, for me, had they just left it with navigable waters, I might have understood it a little bit better. But what are the waters of the United States? And just to make things more fun, we call it WOTUS, for waters of the United States. Um, so one way of thinking about it is that the Clean Water Act was an expression of congressional authority under its commerce power over navigation. So our Navigable waters, those waters that are navigable in fact, that a ship could go up and down in the course of commerce. Are they traditional navigable waters, meaning lakes, rivers, territorial seas, or are they something else? So, not surprisingly, administrative agencies start to push the envelope beyond what we would call traditional navigable waters. And that gets to the United States Supreme Court in 1985 in the Riverside Bayview Homes case, where adjacent wetlands are involved. Wet wetlands adjacent to a stream are those navigable waters. And the court scratches its head and says, well, you know, we can't really figure out where to draw the line between the traditional water and the wetland. And importantly, beyond that, the wetland affects water quality and aquatic ecosystems. And if the goal of the Clean Water Act is to maintain the biological integrity of the nation's waters, don't you have to maintain the biological integrity of the sources of pollutants going into the nation's waters? So the wetlands being a control device for pollutants, it's OK. They're navigable waters. So the administrative agencies try to push the envelope even further. And in the Solid Waste Agency of North and Cook County, there's an isolated pond that is used part of the year by migratory birds. And the agency says, well, the commerce power of the United States should extend to migratory birds, so that's navigable water. And the Supreme Court says, no, it's not. And they give, really, two reasons for it. Number one is it would test the limits of the Commerce Clause. And we don't really want to do that unless Congress specifically says that they're going to the ultimate limits of the Commerce Clause. And second, it infringes upon states' traditional rights to regulate the waters within their jurisdiction. So now all of a sudden we have competing policy goals, one being to maintain the biological integrity of the waters, but the other being states' rights. And that all comes together in the Rapatis case in 2006, where wetlands again are at issue. And we have a plurality decision by Justice Scalia, which says if there's a continuous surface connection, it's a navigable water. And we have Justice Kennedy, who is the fifth vote, who says, let's take a look at whether or not the wetland has a significant nexus to the navigable water, to the traditional navigable water. So to make a long story short, in June of 2015, under the Obama administration, 
EPA and the Army Corps adopt a regulation which essentially adopts the significant nexus test. We can go into some of the specifics later if we need to, but think of it as the specific nexus test. And craziness breaks loose, total craziness. Within months, the district court in North Dakota issues a preliminary injunction blocking the implementation of the rule in 13 states. The Sixth Circuit then steps in, issuing a nationwide stay. Congressional, the Congress issues a joint resolution disapproving of the rule. Obama, of course, doesn't tolerate that. Um, and then the administration changes. And we have uh, POTUS directing EPA to amend words. <laughs> We have an executive order directing EPA to re-examine the rule and essentially re-establish Scalia's opinion as the rule. The administration proposes a rule to rescind the 2015 rule. It proposes a rule and adopts a rule to add a two-year applicability date to the, 15, to the 2015 rule so it just doesn't come into effect. This all gets up to the Supreme Court, which says, Sixth Circuit, you don't have jurisdiction. This should have been filed in the district courts. So the Sixth Circuit lifts the stay, and the District of Georgia steps in and blocks it in 11 additional states. Now we're still dealing with two layers. In the states that it's blocked, which is about 27 states, and we've got this delay rule, so it's really not in effect in any of the additional states. The District of South Carolina steps in and invalidates the delay rule. So now we have the 2015 rule in effect in 27 states. I'm sorry, it stayed in 27 states. So you have the previous EPA and Army Corps rules in effect in 27 states. And in 23 states, you have the Obama rule uh, in effect. So the Trump administration, of course, has you know, proposed a new rule which is open for public comment. And let's just say that what it does is what the administration said it was going to do, that it would impose the scalia rapanos decision uh, as a rule. Um, there are numerous differences between uh, the effects, practical effects of the Scalia rule and uh, the 2015 uh, significant nexus rule. Um, and we can talk about those uh, during the course of our conversation. But when you think about it, we have Congress, which simply said, waters of the United States, didn't tell us what that meant. We have a Supreme Court that by the time it got to Rapanos was divided, couldn't make up its majority mind as to what the proper test was, although everybody did agree that it's more than just traditional navigable waters and then we have the administrative agencies, which are flip-flopping as a result of the change of administration and are being essentially told by the courts that what you're doing uh, is not valid under the statute. So if we're looking for lack of an example of lack of clarity, we found one. It's a good example to start with, right? So maybe we could uh, start by having each of the three of you talk about how regulatory uncertainty about waters of the United States is impacting or does impact some of the clients with whom you've dealt. And, uh, and I guess, John, maybe taking both from the governor perspective that you used to have and from the uh, private practice perspective now. Uh, Alice Baker is at Penn Future, so she can speak from the, the nonprofit advocacy perspective. And Ken Warren, although he does some sort of quasi governmental work with the DRBC, Delaware River Basin Commission also uh, represents private clients as well. So that's the perspective from which you can have to come so I don't know how to respect that. Um, I guess I feel really relieved that most of my practice is in Pennsylvania, so I only have to deal with one state, um, and that Pennsylvania has its own state um, clean streams law, which goes beyond the federal regulations. So that's helpful for my practice, but generally I think um, Thinking about this uncertainty and how I advise my clients on cases, I think about sort of our the public interest's role as either um, stepping into the role of, of an enforcement, um, you know, acting as the attorney general, and, and as a you know private 
um, representing private citizens or as sort of the role of um, developing and pushing law and creating new law, right? So in the, in the realm of being an enforcer, I generally would advise my client that they don't want to um, take on a case where, where the waters of the United States is uncertain. Right? You, I would want to bring an enforcement action where I am absolutely clear that I have all of the elements of the Clean Water Act and that I know what water is, is being impacted and that is clearly a covered water. And so there I, I would advise against the uncertainty, right? But in other situations, I think the public interest sphere sort of enjoys that uncertainty because there's the opportunity to um, develop case law that might refine or um, sort of adapt that uncertainty in the direction that, that we as environmentalists want it to be um, uh, pushed. And so, so there there's more of a, um, you know, there's the, there's the risk, but the uncertainty is part of why you're taking that risk, is to, to solidify something and to, to develop some case law. So, so I sort of think about it in, a, in those two different ways in, um, in, in my practice. So. Two thousand six, uh, uh, I am at one of our outlying buildings. I'm then the Deputy Assistant Attorney General and Rapanos comes out. Now, up until the time of Rapanos, we thought we had some idea uh, of the jurisdictional issues of water in the United States. It had gone to the Supreme Court twice, there were regulations that were in effect, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Rapanos comes out, and as Ken has already explained to you, it's, it's like a three-part uh, uh, ruling. You know, four justices uh, with, uh, uh, supported by Justice Scalia. Kennedy is in the majority, but has a completely different idea uh, of jurisdiction, then you have four that are in the minority. And I can remember it being there. We had, at Justice, you had, we were, we were defending uh, uh, lawsuits against the government, challenging our, our uh, the views, particularly the Environmental Protection Agency of the Court of Engineers. We were bringing civil and criminal cases uh, uh, based on what we thought was the law of jurisdiction. And I'm reading a brief that was handed to me uh, uh, by an unnamed uh, uh, U.S. attorney uh, who is trying to talk about the fact that that day, trying to uh, uh, bring a criminal action uh, about water in the United States, Rapanos comes out and he says, it was a guy, he says, uh, uh, well, actually, no one can figure this one out. <laughs> now, we took that out uh, of the brief. But he had a point. You know, he had a point. When that happens, uh, you do not have a majority of opposition. Uh, uh, you have different views. I've always said this is like, you know, a law school professor's dream come true, uh, because anything you say, you know, there's something in the opinion that supports your view uh, 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 there. I testified before Congress three times uh, 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 about this, ultimately saying there was a position of the Department of Justice, which it is today, too, by the way, uh, 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 that if uh, the United States could satisfy either the test of Scalia or the test of Kennedy, uh, uh, then that would be good enough. All right, so either one, uh, under the theory that together they had five votes, uh, and so if we could do either one. Uh, uh, it, it would not shock you that not every court agreed with that position. That would not shock you. Uh, 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 there. By the way, uh, uh, every court agreed uh, uh, that you could do the Kennedy test, uh, 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 but some courts said you could not do just the Scalia test. Uh, 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 there, in sort of complicated ways. But anyway, uh, out of that, uh, uh, everybody, everybody thought uh, uh, that one of two things had to happen to straighten this out. Either the Supreme Court was going to have to take another case uh, to straighten this out because it was so mixed up, or in the absence of the Supreme Court taking another case, which they have not done, by the way, uh, 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 then the other answer was uh, the federal com government coming out with a rule. And by the way, everybody thought that. Industry thought that. The agricultural community, everybody thought that. But of course, they wanted a rule that they liked. Uh, 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 there, the rule comes out, and, and, and you know, lots of people do not like it. Uh, and so, what happens in the United States when you have a rule that you don't like? You hire one of us. You know, uh, 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 there. Then the question is, where do you sue? Where do you bring? Ordinarily, in most of the things that we have, we're talking about, ordinarily you go to district courts. Uh, uh, that's the first, those are trial courts, those are courts of first impression. 
uh, 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 but in a lot of uh, cases, particularly when you're dealing with rules, there are specialized rules handling where you go for rules. So for like, in, for instance, under the Clean Air Act, uh, the rule says if, it, if, it's a, if it's a case of national jurisdiction, it could only go to the DC Circuit. That's the only place, and not to the district court, it goes to the Court of Appeals. So that's the only place you can uh, uh, take it. That's the law. Clean Water Act was not true. Clean Water Act was very, very unclear. Uh, uh, do you start in the district court and you start in the Court of Appeals? So a lot of people challenging it, challenged it simultaneously in both. They went to both different places. Uh, what I didn't tell you when I was talking to you about both Deepwater Horizon and Volkswagen is also those are cases where we had hundreds of challenges going on. But there's something called a multi-district litigation panel that can consolidate all those district court cases. And that's what happened in BP and Volkswagen. It did not happen here. Uh, uh, they tried, the government tried, well I was there, we tried to consolidate it, and they did not do that. But the Courts of Appeals did. The Courts of Appeals brought all their cases together in the Sixth Circuit. Uh, so you had dueling things going on at the same time. You had some people in district courts, uh, but all the Courts of Appeals, and that's happening simultaneously. <laughs> and, and the point that I think both Ken and Alice made is that that creates enormous uncertainty. Uh, uh, if you're a company or if you're an environmental group, if you're an individual, you're trying to get a permit, uh, where do I go and what standards uh, 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 exist? Uh, because now you have the old rule and you have the new rule, uh, uh, and, and uh, all of that is happening simultaneously. Uh, uh, then, and it just happened last year, then the Supreme Court weighs in uh, and says uh, it's only going to be district court. By the way, when I was at Department of Justice, uh, uh, we filed a brief to the Supreme Court that said, we think they ought to all be in the Court of Appeals, not the District Court, and if you don't do that, it'll be chaos. They didn't do that, and it was chaos uh, 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 out there, because now you have just exactly what Ken has explained to you, uh, uh, depending on where you are in the United States right now, depending on where you are, you might have different standards, uh, and you certainly have different rules uh, 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 that will apply to you. Uh, and so these are challenging. These sorts of cases where you don't have a clear uh, uh, opinion are very, very challenging then, uh, both in and out of the government trying to figure out today, uh, uh, you know, what do I have to do? What standards do I have to meet? What are the rules that are applicable to me if I'm trying to get a permit uh, uh, that, you know, to develop land, you know, a permit to discharge uh, into uh, uh, waters in the United States? And of course, the real issue of this is, this is uh, 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 we talk about waters in the United States, but a lot of it is where is wetland, where maybe it's not wet, it's wet part of the time, but not all of the time. Uh, it could be headwaters, where you know it rains and that drains down and then creates rivers, but but that doesn't happen all the time. Uh, as Ken said, it could be adjacent, right, adjacent to uh, a river body, and that's where the wetlands are that obviously affect that water. Those are the contentious issues uh, 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 that are there, um, but they were contentious in 2006 when the Panos came out and they're contentious right now. Um, from the point of view of trying to advise clients, I think it's important to keep in mind that there are state programs as well as federal programs. And the state programs are not restricted by federal jurisdiction. And so when a client approaches me and, for example, might want to do a construction project in an area that could conceivably be wetlands. As John said, it's not wet, but it might have hydric soils, it might have vegetation that makes it look like a wetland, and there are all these criteria that you have to use to decide whether something is a wetland rather than if it looks like and smells like a wetland. So you would look to normally you know, state statutes and state regulations uh, to do that. Um, we have the Dam Safety and Encroachment Act in Pennsylvania and we have you know, chapter 105 regulations, and that's really where the conversation starts. Um, there are relationships that the DEP has with the Army Corps of Engineers, and the reason I'm saying the Army Corps is in Pennsylvania, like most states, the NPDES program is delegated. And so the state is going to at least be the initial decision maker when it comes to discharges um, of wastewater um, into, into a stream, but not so much when it involves dredged and fill material because that's a program that's still administered federally by the Army Corps of Engineers. 
In fact, I think that's true in, in, in all but two states in the country, New Jersey and Michigan, who have delegation. But in Pennsylvania, we, we don't. Um, and so um, you would look to the state, I think, at that point to tell you whether it felt that it was a wetland that had to be permitted. And then you would see what kind of coordination could be done between the state permitting and any necessary Army Corps permitting. And you know there are programmatic permits and national permits that the Army Corps has that might satisfy you. You might not have to get an individual permit, but sometimes you do. And I think the, the entry is usually through the state program officer. So one way, one question that I have is, what's the cause? We we've, we've seen sort of the 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 way in which the regulatory uncertainty has manifested itself in terms of court decisions, statutes, regulations. Well, what do you all think is the underlying cause of the uncertainty? And if you're talking to a non-lawyer, I think you often get some version of the man on the moon question, right? It's like, if we can put a man on the moon, why can't we define what a water of the United States is? So um, there's scientific issues here, there's political issues, there's legal issues, but to what do you attribute the sort of persistent uh, uncertainty in this area? I think what you teach in law school is relevant to this, Ty, because you teach both property law and environmental law. And sometimes when I'm talking about uh, controversies in environmental law, I talk about intersections of the law, uh, where you have two different parallel theories and then they intersect, uh, and it's a problem. My, my always favorite one is bankruptcy law and environmental law. So if it, uh, uh, bankruptcy law, where you get a fresh start, environmental law, where you're liable forever, forever. Uh, 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 when it intersects, uh, uh, it, it, it's the law is uncertain uh, in that regard. How do you handle, you know, a, a company that says I can no longer keep up the property, but the property is polluted? How do you handle that? I think it's true in this area too. The real controversy, I think, is an intersection between property law uh, and environmental law. Property law will think I can do what I want with my own property. I can build on it. Uh, I can divert water. I can, if I farm it, I can fill in holes because I want to uh, 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 build more. Uh, uh, because it belongs to me. Uh, and, and environmental law, which says, wait a minute, you have a, if you have a more responsibility <coughs> than that, uh, uh, the, those things that you're filling in are wetlands that actually are, you know, help drain and purify water before it hits the, the river. They're also uh, a breeding ground for birds and things. There's a other value to that that you ought to take into consideration. So that intersection uh, between property law and environmental law causes a lot of the issues that we're seeing uh, when we see regulatory uncertainty uh, in uh, uh, wetlands. I don't know, Alice and, and, and Ken, you might have different views, but I see it as this intersection. You know, I, I, I agree with John. I, I also think that, um, you know, the science moves towards an ecosystem analysis, while our statutes don't necessarily do that. And so when you talk about the Clean Water Act and you look initially to, you know, preservation of biological integrity, that doesn't necessarily say that we're going to have an entire ecosystem approach because you're still looking narrowly at water. And you know, when you start to expand to this sort of a significant nexus approach that uh, Justice Kennedy was talking about, he's really saying what are the ecosystem functions and values of a particular water-based structure such as a wetland? And how do those ecosystem and if you were to destroy that in some way or compromise it in some way, what would be the ecosystem effects more broadly? Would it, if, you know, water flows downhill, does it affect the tributaries or the streams or the creeks or other wetlands that are down gradient from the water body that's being affected? And our environmental statutes really aren't structured to do that. They're very media-based. Um, and, and I think that there is you know, some tension at this point between where we've advanced as, as science and where we still are from a legal standpoint. Yeah, I think that's, that's the way I've been thinking about a lot of this as well, is that um, sort of science is this interrelated web of things and you're trying to impose this structure of um, limited uh, power laws and statutes onto that and that you end up just sort of not being able to capture the whole um, the whole interrelatedness of the of the science, and I think that's coming up. And it's not just the Clean Water Act, right? It comes up in the Clean Air Act as well, trying to regulate climate change. So that's a, that's one of the th ways that I've really been thinking about it too. 
Um, so we've talked about Congress, we've talked about courts, agencies, private sector. Which of those institutions is, do you think, best situated to resolve the uncertainty, or any of them best situated to resolve the uncertainty? And, when, and which are particularly not well situated? Well, I can tell you what we tried. <laughs> it did work, <laughs> but I can tell you what we tried. Uh, uh, so, uh, uh, so Rapatos comes out, and I told you I testified. I testified before the House and Senate, you know, told it three times on, on, on that. And it was not you know, confusing to anyone that uh, uh, this is a problem. It was a problem uh, of a somewhat significant uh, magnitude because there's a real difference, uh, you know. So, you know, you have the Supreme Court speaking on this issue, uh, and, 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 and you cannot figure out what you're supposed to do based on the Supreme Court test. Uh, and so that was an, an enormous challenge. And so what would normally happen under those circumstances, remember I showed you, you know, all the history of our statutes, is you go to Congress. You go to Congress and you say, we need to fix this because you can. Uh, and, and by the way, in fairness to the Supreme Court, the Clean Water Act is not a model of certainty. <laughs> uh, uh, and you already heard, you know, uh, 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 Ken describe, you know, what, what, what's a navigable water? Is the water of the United States? What is that? Uh, uh, so, and, and does that pick up, you know, uh, you know wetland that's really not water it's all, all the time? You know, so, it, you know, in fairness to the Supreme Court, uh, uh, it's not in the area. And, and so what should happen, uh, uh, again, is the ability to go back to Congress and, and to ask them, provide certainty uh, 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 to this area, because everybody wants it. Uh, uh, the, the regulated community wants some idea, how do I plan development in the future? Uh, 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 NGOs want to know what, what, if I'm litigating, if I'm filing a citizen suit, what are the standards that I need to apply? Uh, 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 AGS 7 in the Corps of Engineers is walking the property and trying to figure out uh, uh, whether or not this is you know, governed or not by my regulations. They all want the same thing. Uh, uh, and, and it did not happen. Uh, it did not happen in the House, and we, we did both the House and then the Senate. We, we both went to both trying to and offered suggestions, as you would imagine as to how you could uh, uh, figure it out, uh, but it was too controversial. Uh, it pitted the agricultural community in large part uh, 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 against what we think of sort of the environmental uh, community, and, and it was way more geographic than it was Republican Democrat, that split, way more geographic uh, in that regard. Uh, and so as a result, you know, there were uh, numerous proposals, nothing came out uh, of the legislature, which would have been the right answer. That would have been the right answer. And if, in fact, that had worked, then we would all be operating under those particular standards. When that does not happen, uh, uh, then you have to fall back to the other two branches of government. You have to fall back to either uh, 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 litigating it uh, and trying to get some, some help through courts or the regulatory process, which is uh, uh, what Ken and Ellis have already described. So before we go on with that, so let's just talk about Congress a minute. So you talked about Tosca in your presentation and about how the uncertainty there and people knew that there was a problem that needed to be fixed across the table and compromise. Why don't we see that uh, with the Clean Water Act, with the Clean Water Act jurisdiction? Why not ambiguity, controversy, everybody get, doesn't get everything they want, but we walk away with a political compromise? I will pass that one to Alice. <laughs> Oh, I don't know. Um, I actually didn't really think of Congress as being the appropriate place for it to be decided because it was such a um, such a this mix of science, and that the agency really is supposed to have that expertise. Unfortunately, that means that it ends up shifting with the different jurisdiction or the different sort of um, presidencies and and direction that the agencies are getting. Um, I think I don't know. I sort of struggle with Congress defining this unless it were just to limit it in such a in such a tight way and then I and then I think that you end up just having such a political hailstorm of of everyone fighting for what they want that you couldn't get that through. I don't know what Ken, do you have thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean my, my perspective is that the regulated community actually wants two things. First they want certainty <laughs> and that's what they keep saying. But secondly, they want certainty that they're not covered by the Clean Water Act. <laughs> you could easily give them certainty on the other side, and they would say, we don't accept that. So there's two layers. 
And I think that from a strategic standpoint, um, they're thinking that they are more likely to get a favorable result not having Congress clarify it than they are having Congress clarify it. Um, that would be even more true now where the House has uh, become democratic. And they, I mean, look at all the courts that have already stayed the 2015 rule on the grounds that in, in the judicial view, it goes beyond um, you know, what Congress authorized in the act. And we have an even more conservative Supreme Court now. So as a tactical matter, um, yes, you could get certainty, but getting the result you want probably is more geared towards the administrative agencies and the courts right now than it is toward Congress. Is there something about, so sometimes when I'm teaching, I talk about where there, where I see regulatory cliffs. So there's a situation, you know, where you draw a line and on one side you're essentially not regulated and on the other side there's, whether it's stringent enough, but fairly stringent regulation. Is there something about issues like that, which maybe would, there wouldn't be under Tosca, right? Um, that's regulatory cliffs that make it harder to, for there both to be certainty, but also harder for there to be compromise? I, mean, I think that's a good question, uh, because uh, uh, Tosca, which does in fact, without question, uh, uh, could easily split uh, into you know, uh, uh, arguments like we're having right now, did not, in, in part because on the core issues, there, were, there was some other difficult state-related issues, but on the core issues, very quickly, uh, uh, the NGO community and the, and the uh, 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 regulated community came together. And, and there certainly was absolutely a consensus uh, that we needed to have a, a legal change. Absolutely a consensus. But then on core issues, very rapidly came together. Uh, on, in this issue, uh, 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 again, everybody fairly quickly came together and said we need a regulation. Or excuse me, we need a law. We need a legal change uh, uh, there. That was understood, I think. Uh, 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 there and there was zero agreement on what that would be uh, uh, because there was an impetus uh, uh, to uh, uh, roll back to do actually do less uh, than the current Clean Water Act at the same time uh, uh, environmental community was pushing to do more so we, we, I, on, on any of the core issues there really was not any consensus at all uh, uh, where in Tosca there was there was core consensus and we never got that uh, uh, in the legislature. So, and, and, and at this particular time, by the way, this is, you know, uh, 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 there, you know, the, uh, uh, the House and Senate were, uh, were actually receptive. They had hearings, they went over all of that, uh, but we never got a bill that even got voted on uh, uh, during that time period. Um, so maybe we'll open it up to questions in just a little bit, but uh, maybe one last question, and then I'll see if you all have a question too. You had to predict where this is going. Are we gonna, I mean, it's been a long pattern here. Is it going to be any different five years from now in terms of more certainty, more resolution, or is this a, is this going to look pretty similar um, five years from now? Though? So since I've been public on this, and I guess it just got publicized, so I'll repeat to you what I said. Uh, now. I'm not exactly a complete bystander. I defended the Obama rule. Uh, we filed briefs in support of the Obama rule, and I was very much involved in it. All right, so you have to take what I say with a grain of salt. But I said publicly that uh, uh, in, uh, let's see, we're halfway through this administration, more or less, that the two years from now, uh, the Waters of the United States rule will still exist. Uh, it will still be stayed, uh, probably, uh, uh, but it will still exist. And, and, and why is that true? Uh, so now I'm going to go back to what I told you in my first period about the Administrative Procedure Act. So if you make a decision, a final decision, you litigate that. So if in fact you do what Ken said, uh, the administration is planning on doing, you rescind uh, uh, the 2015 rule, that is a final decision. You litigate that decision, number one. Number two, if you decide you want to extend the effective date of that rule by two years, that is a final decision. You will litigate that decision, uh, which is happening now. If, in fact, you pass a new regulation uh, and that becomes final, that is a final decision and you will litigate that. So it is possible, and not only possible, very likely, that there will be three sets of litigation going on simultaneously and they will be in different district courts because everybody's litigating gets to pick their own favorable, favorable court, right? 
Uh, and so you know, some will go to South Carolina or go to Georgia or go to Washington and follow the South Carolina case. And other people will go to you know, North Dakota or somewhere else where it will be favorable. And, and then you start getting these conflicting injunctions uh, 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 that happen. And you know, where a district court uh, says, well, since I, I'm a district court judge, which makes me uh, 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 quite powerful, uh, uh, and I think what I do is good for America, uh, I'm going to enjoy uh, or talk about things way beyond my court. I'm going to talk about things for all of America. Uh, so you have these nationwide injunctions, and then you get battling nationwide injunctions. Uh, and then trying to resolve that is, is, is really complicated. So I'm absolutely confident uh, that if the three of us were coming back in two years, we could still talk to you about uh, uh, the chaos of waters in the United States. So that's my view. I would, I would definitely agree with that in terms, of, in terms of the litigation. I think also in terms of just certainty for, for implementing projects or people on the ground, that the, the proposed, the new proposed rule that hasn't even been um, put out for public comment yet is not gonna provide any certainty either. And I think that largely to do with, the, with what we were talking about earlier with the science, right? That they're sort of excluding these certain streams, but, but the line between ephemeral and intermittent, like who knows whether that stream is ephemeral or intermittent, and I think that that's just gonna provide um, more uncertainty on, on the ground in implementing projects. Well, I guess I'm a little bit more optimistic in a, in a, in a sense that I think that the, <laughs> The areas of disagreement are limited, and you know, as John pointed out, you know, the farming community it really you know impacts them quite a lot. It might impact the mining community because if you're trying to expand your mine, you know, are you expanding it into waters of the United States? But I think that there is, for most industry and, and, and most users, a fair amount of certainty in the rule. Um, you know, we don't really get into a lot of debates in Pennsylvania as to under what circumstances you need an NPDES permit. There are limited disputes about that, but most people understand what they need to do. And I think that the, you know, it's a big fringe, but I think that the uncertainty on the fringes um, is really going to have to await more of what John was describing before as a popular environmental consensus as to really where the country wants environmental laws to go. Because there's gridlock now in Congress. Um, the courts are split ideologically. And I think it's basically the people who are going to have to make this decision ultimately and, and, force, and force the solution on the decision makers. I would say, Kim, when I testified before Congress, before the, on the Senate, uh, and I was trying to explain what we thought was the jurisdiction after Rapanos. Uh, the senator from Georgia said, leaned over and said, Mr. Cruden, as far as I'm concerned, uh, it sounds to me like if I spit on the ground one time, uh, you think uh, you have jurisdiction. And I thought to myself, no, that's true twice. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Any questions for the panel? Yes. When you move a little bit from the waters of the U.S., but still uncertainty in the Clean Water Act, you may or may not have thought about this part. Um, moving from waters of the U.S. to discharge and what is covered, and split in the courts and changes in agency, possibly changes in agency policies with regards to what is a discharge and hydro hydrologically connected groundwater. Um, do you have any thoughts about the impact of that uncertainty? You want to do Maui? <laughs> uh, I mean, I'll start. I mean, you're, you're referring to there is a split among the courts as to whether a discharge to groundwater is a discharge to, to a navigable water. Um, the proposed rule um, would take the position that groundwater is not a navigable water. And my personal view is that's just contrary to science. Um, you know, one can affect the waters of the United States as much by discharging a pollutant through groundwater to those waters as through surface water. Um, you know, I won't hazard a guess as to whether or not the current Supreme Court would view the Clean Water Act that broadly and take a scientific approach as opposed to sort of a more um, 
linguistic approach that waters of the U.S. were intended by the legislature to only mean surface water. Um, but I think if ultimately we have what I hope will be an ecosystem approach to environmental management, it's going to need to include groundwater as much as surface water. And, you know, the states understand that. Um, and, you know, I think that even Congress understood that. For example, the Delaware River Basin Commission that I represent, where it has jurisdiction over the waters of the basin, the waters of the basin include the groundwater as well as the surface water. So I do think there is an understanding, at least by people who are scientifically advised, that groundwater needs to be included. It is really a great question, really a great question. And it's a great question because it is really timely. Uh, so right now, right this second, uh, uh, the Supreme Court is considering uh, taking a case coming out of uh, uh, Maui uh, uh, in Hawaii, uh, uh, where there were injection wells, uh, and they did dye tests, and the inject and the dye showed in some of the well discharges that it went from groundwater, so it goes underground through groundwater, that ultimately into the Pacific Ocean. And based on that, uh, uh, the district court and then the Ninth Circuit agreeing said that is covered by the Clean Water Act. But without question, it, the pathway was groundwater, without question, uh, in that case. And groundwater has historically been state jurisdiction, not federal jurisdiction, under the Clean Water Act. Uh, and so that goes to the Ninth Circuit. Uh, it, there has been a petition now to the Supreme Court to decide that case. Uh, and the Supreme Court takes cases if it's a pretty big deal, big important, or there's a split. Uh, and here there probably is a split uh, with another uh, uh, court. And so we may well see the Supreme Court looking at exactly the issue that you're talking about. And that is, uh, is, it a, is it a discharge? Because the discharge was not into the ocean. The discharge was into the groundwater, but the groundwater ultimately shows up uh, 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 in the ocean, which obviously is a big enough place uh, and big enough water. So that is a pending case right this second uh, 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 there. And my own guess is the Supreme Court will take it uh, uh, there. So we might see, remember, we, they had endless opportunity to review Rapados, and they did not do it. But this one I think they might take uh, uh, because, again, uh, their courts of appeals are split on this issue. I've been thinking a little bit about those cases in terms of the the new proposed Trump Florida's rule and um, and the and the articulation in that rule that um, waters have to have these surface connections and um, wetlands have to have surface connections and depending on how this circuit split turns out then potentially you could use that hydrological connection theory to sort of rope back in a lot of other waters um, in the in the United States. So, I mean, it's, an, it's definitely interesting. And, um, I want to go to the argument if the Supreme Court hears it. So. I will say this is our internal justice stuff, but it's still fun. Uh, I'll tell you about, so the Solicitor General got, it, is obviously involved in, in this. Uh, 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 during my era, we filed an amicus brief uh, in the Maui case. Uh, and we supported Clean Water Act jurisdiction. We said if there was a direct hydrological connection between the discharge uh, and the waters of the United States, then it was covered. Uh, by the way, that's not exactly the language of the Ninth Circuit. So the Ninth Circuit actually did not agree with that, although they did find Clean Water Act jurisdiction. So the, so, but the Solicitor General gets to weigh in, very powerful position, very powerful position in the government. And the Solicitor General says, Supreme Court, you ought to take the case. But we can't figure out our position right now. <laughs> uh, uh, because the Environmental Protection Agency had gone out on one of these notices of, this has just happened, what do you think? Uh, 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 so the Supreme say, I, we don't know. He might come up with a different position. So we're not going to tell you our position, but we do think you ought to take the case uh, uh, there. So, yeah, so stay tuned. We'll see uh, uh, what ultimately the position is. But I think just because of what Alice said, uh, they're trying to look at what the proposed rule is, and does that stay consistent with what they're, uh, and they have not been final on that rule yet. Uh, and kind of building on what Alice is saying, there is that language in Justice Scalia's Rapanos decision that kind of says, don't worry so much about a constrictive view of waters of the United States because some discharges will make their way to waters of the United States, and so there is an interplay between those two issues. Uh, I also thought kind of was interesting the point you made about sort of a more legal linguistic interpretation and a more scientific one. That's another way of thinking of Rapanos. Justice Scalia is a very, I would call, 
not as a criticism, but just it is not a science-based approach that he is taking, and so trying to apply science to prove a case under his standard is really difficult. Justice Kennedy seems much more attuned to something that would be a scientific-based proof, so, you know, like John was talking about dye tests and things like that. Um, and it's two very different ways of, of thinking about a legal problem. So, of course, now Justice Kennedy and is gone, who was the author of the significant nexus test, and, 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 it, and as Kennedy and Ellis have already pointed out, that was the genesis, certainly, of the Obama rule. Uh, and, and so, but his legacy continues. Uh, so, uh, uh, what do uh, uh, Gorsuch and Kavanaugh have in common? They were both Kennedy clerks. They were both Kennedy clerks. None of us think that they would necessarily go both the same way that Kennedy does on these issues. <coughs> Good question. Um, I guess the last question I had, and you touched on this all a little bit, but yeah, like, so I. I kind of said, look, I think regulatory uncertainty here may be persistent, may always come. But say the 2000, like much of the problem with the 2015 rule has been the litigation about it. To what extent, if the, two, if the 2015 rule had just been miracle of miracles, adopted, no litigation, it just goes into effect, to what extent would it have resolved the ambiguity here? How much uncertainty would there be under that rule? There's a lot of uncertainty around the fringes um, because, you know, if you look at Justice Kennedy's opinion where he talks about a significant nexus, he talks about it essentially individually or cumulatively. Yeah. You don't necessarily look at a, a single wetland in isolation and say whether if you abolished or impaired that wetland, whether that would cause a significant problem to a water of the United States. You, you ask yourself, about similarly situated wetlands in the same general geographic area. And you know, if you're a property owner and you're looking at a particular wetland and now you have to do this cumulative analysis, um, it's pretty daunting. I mean, you'd have to go out and hire a consultant thing. You have to assume that consultants might differ as to the geographic area and the effects and the evaluations. And it could be awfully expensive to actually do that analysis as, as, as well. Um, but, you know, again, I think in the core areas, you don't have uncertainty and life would go on and, you know, in, in most, for most companies it would be okay, but where, where you're trying to operate on the fringe, there just is a lot of uncertainty. And you were saying that it's like, you see it as largely sectoral, so you said mining, agricultural, probably home building would be, or construction would be right. a third category. Yeah. There's a, there's a tension, which I don't think everybody appreciates, uh, uh, in what regulations can do and what they can't do. Actually, government cannot really invent on their own regulations. Regulations have to emanate from <coughs> legal authority. There has to be a statute somewhere that gives you the authority to do things. And regulations, particularly in this area, every one of them are changed. And one of their arguments always is, it is beyond your statutory authority to do that. Congress has not given you that ability uh, uh, to do that issue. So if you're, if, you, if you're thinking, is this going to be a perfect regulation? It will not be. It, it, it will not be perfect. Uh, uh, it won't be perfect because it, you start doing things that look legislatively. And if it looks legislative, you will lose the regulation. The regulation will be challenged and the, and the court will set it aside, which happens all the time. And one of the reasons why is because you did not have authority to do that uh, 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 there. So there is a, uh, uh, a restraint on how far uh, uh, regulations can go because, you know, Ken's absolutely right. They would not have answered all the questions. They would not have uh, 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 there. But my point is it was being challenged. Remember, we filed a brief in support of it. Uh, uh, there, uh, uh, which may never get answered, but but you're 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 resisting, uh, defending against a challenge that you did something that you were not empowered to do, that that should have been legislation, not a regulation. And if a court finds that, the court sets aside uh, uh, that regulation. So ideally, and, and I think this is you know what Alice is saying, the regulation would be, would be better because you have scientific 
uh, people doing things, and they're the people that are uh, 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 more thoughtful uh, about the, you know, what's going to happen on the ground and, and, or the ecological issues, uh, but that still has to emanate uh, from some legislative authority, and the Clean Water Act is not perfect in that regard. Um, yeah, I don't, I, I guess I agree with both of you on that, don't have much to add. Great, well thank you very much for the, everything you said.